flavour of bacon is a sublime combination. Don't panic and think it's burnt because the molasses make it look really black like this. So remove a little bit of crackling first and then just cut it into slices. Now the Cumberland sauce that goes with the gammon is always served cold with the hot gammon, which is a nice contrast. And then the final, final garnish is going to be this, which is the blackened crackling. Coming up, turkey and all the trimmings, but also some great alternatives, including something special for vegetarians on Christmas Day. We've also got ideas for snacks with drinks and party stuff. Well, this is the bit I've really been looking forward to because now we're going to talk turkey. And I have to confess to you, I really do love turkey and I think some people don't get turkey and I want to show you how to get it today. Now, when you're buying a turkey, if you can see a little band of fat down here, it means you've got a good one because fat is very important to the cooking to keep it moist. And also, if it's a real proper one and not a mass-produced one, you might have a little bit of designer stubble, but that's nothing to worry about. You can take it out with the eyebrow tweezers if you want to, but I don't bother. So that turkey now is going to next have some stuffing in it, and I'm going to use classic sage and onion stuffing. Here's how to make it. Process chunks of bread into a rough texture. Add sage then onions and combine with good quality pork sausage meat. Next, add two tablespoons of water and seasoning. Then combine with a fork, but finish off by hand. Now it's time to stuff the turkey. It's quite easy to do it. At the end here, you'll see a neck flap. Lift it up and what I'm going to do is put my hand in and just ease the skin away from the flesh. Then you just take handfuls of the stuffing, easy as pie, just pack it in, there we go. Now the reason for the stuffing and the reason why it goes inside the bird is that pork is a fatty meat and what that does is while the turkey's cooking, the stuffing melts and internally bastes it and keeps it lovely and moist and succulent and then just get some toothpicks to just seal that flap down. Just push them in so that you're just tucking that down and sealing it. What I'm going to do with the rest of the stuffing, I'm going to put that in the body cavity. Now we're going to put some butter on it. Smear the butter all over. I have to say I've never in my life ever had a dry turkey. Right, next we're going to put a little bit of seasoning on and then I'm going to put slices of streaky bacon to protect the breast while it's cooking so we're never going to have a dry breast, it's always going to be juicy. And now that's ready for cooking. Underneath here, I've got a baking tray, and then the baking tray has two pieces of foil, one going that way and one going this way. But the reason I've got so much foil here is because I don't want to completely enclose it. You bring it up to the top, then you just make a little pleat, and what we're doing here is we're making another little oven. So it sits in an oven inside another oven and this protects it. Now that's all ready to go into the oven. For an average 6.5 kilogram turkey, preheat the oven to 220 degrees. Then give it a good blast of heat for 40 minutes 
then turn it down to 170 degrees and let it cook slowly. This is bread sauce. If you've never tried it, I promise you it's another great English classic. First, finely process breadcrumbs. Then add a large onion cut in half and studded with cloves. Put it in a saucepan with milk. Pop in a bay leaf, some peppercorns and a sprinkling of salt. Bring to the boil, take off the heat and leave it in a warm place to let the onion juices infuse for a couple of hours. Remove the onion and seasonings. Add the breadcrumbs until they swell and thicken the sauce. Next, add half the butter. Put the onion back and leave in a warm place until you need it. Just before serving, remove the onion squeezing all the juice out as much as you can get between two plates. Reheat gently, then add thick Channel Island cream. Pour into a jug and add the rest of the butter. To check the turkey, half an hour before it's ready, take it out of the oven, remove the bacon and trim back the foil. Then you can start basting. Best thing to use is a long handled kitchen spoon like this. Lift up the corner of the tin just to tip it slightly and you'll see all the lovely juices. This is what old fashioned cooks always did. Lots and lots of basting because then the juices just add to the flavour. And also, the bacon that's on the plate here, what I do with that is I put it on the floor of the oven and it just finishes cooking and getting nice and crisp. But keep an eye on it. So, back we go to the oven. For the last half hour of the cooking time, hike up the oven temperature to 200 degrees and allow the turkey to brown. Keep on basting and you'll actually see the juices bubbling up underneath the skin. Now I have to show you what is without doubt the best cranberry sauce ever, and I still can't believe the simplicity of it. It's called cranberry relish, and you begin by pulsing the cranberries in a processor. Or you could chop them by hand. Pop them into a saucepan with caster sugar, the juice and rind of an orange, freshly grated root ginger, a piece of cinnamon, four cloves, and simmer it for just five minutes. Then remove from the heat, add two to three tablespoons of port, and remember to take the cloves and cinnamon out. If there's any left over, it's great served with cold cuts and it'll keep in the fridge for up to two weeks. Right, this is called Catch the Moment, and now we're going to see is it cooked or isn't it cooked. All you have to use is this very important piece of kitchen equipment, which is a skewer. Couldn't cook without a skewer, I couldn't. And what we're going to do now is go into the middle of the thickest part of the leg with the skewer, like that, and then you can see all the, all the juice rushing out. Now what we want to see now are the juices clear. And this is, that means the turkey is done. 
If the juices are slightly pink, it isn't, and you just need to whack it back for another 10 minutes and then have another look. What's going to happen now is the turkey will be transferred to a board because it's done, and while it rests, all those juices kind of seep back into the flesh, which is what makes it nice and juicy when you eat it. Now all we want is a turkey gravy with masses of flavour. First, drain off any excess fat and juices into a jug. Take two to three tablespoons of fat and add to a saucepan with some flour. Then blend that into the fat. Next, ladle stock made from the reserved turkey giblets into the pan, stirring all the time until it bubbles and thickens. Then add a dash of gravy browning if you want a richer colour, a little more stock if it needs it, and simmer gently until you're ready to serve it. We've lived here now for 40 years and love being in the country, close to the changing seasons. I always think winter has its own special beauty and as we approach the very darkest days of all, we have this great feast to look forward to. Well, although it's very nice to stick with tradition, and I always do, Christmas does last for eight days. There are other days, and if you don't want to have a turkey on Christmas Day, well, there are other lovely things too. This one's a perennial favourite if you want to serve an alternative or something to serve on other days. This is a really great recipe. It was an old classic French recipe called Boeuf en Croute, which translated means fillet of beef wrapped in pastry with a wild mushroom stuffing. In the saucepan here, I've got butter, and that's been melted. And then in my bowl, I've got finely chopped onion and finely chopped dark gilled mushrooms. And that's going to go in with the butter. And then the other ingredient, is dried porcini mushrooms. I'm going to soak these in hot water for about 20 minutes and then keep the soaking liquid for later. They're going to go in and join the rest and just give all that a good stir together. So what I'm going to do now is turn the heat down and let it simmer gently for about 35 minutes. But first of all, I'm going to add this, which is freshly grated nutmeg. And I've been saying this for 40 years, but I'm going to say it once more. And that is, don't use nutmeg ready grated. It, it loses all its kick. Then we're going to have some salt and pepper. What will happen now, especially when I add a bit of salt, is the mushrooms and the onions, while they're cooking, are going to release all their juices. And when the juices have all reduced and evaporated and gone away, you have this really wonderful, concentrated, wild mushroom flavour, which is brilliant. But remember to keep one tablespoon of the mushroom mix for the sauce later. Here we've got a rather splendid piece of beef, a whole piece of fillet. Before it gets wrapped in the pastry, it needs to have a lovely brown, crusty edge. So what I'm going to do is season it with some salt and pepper. And I've got a pan here that is really, really hot. I always say hot as you dare. So in we go with the fillet. So that's going to cool down now, but whilst it's cooling, it's going to have a bit of a brush with something special, which is brandy. And what I forgot to tell you is, when you're browning the beef, if you use beef dripping, you get a nice extra bit of beefy flavour into it. Ah! 
Once the beef has become quite cold, the mushrooms have reduced and become dry in texture and cooled, you can begin the next stage. We're now going to wrap the piece of beef in pastry. But first of all, what I'm going to do is put a third of the mushroom mixture down the centre of the pastry like this and spread it out. Then I'm going to take the beef and place the beef on top of the mushroom mixture in the centre and then the rest of the mushroom is going to just be packed around the beef. It sort of almost completely encases it. And you need to do this with your hands. Now, the next thing you do is you just brush the edges of the piece of pastry with beaten egg. And then, as it's Christmas, we're going to wrap it up like a Christmas parcel, like a Christmas gift. I make my own really quick flaky pastry, but if you're short of time, you can use ready-made all-butter puff pastry. Brush with a beaten egg if it's going straight into the oven, and for a festive feel, decorate with pastry leaves and berries. Pop into a preheated oven for around half an hour, depending on how rare you like it. Whilst it's cooking, you can make the red wine sauce. Using the same hot pan you seared the beef in, add the reserved mushroom soaking liquid, bring to the boil, let it bubble and reduce. Then add a good slug of red wine and a heaped tablespoon of the mushroom mix. Season, then let it reduce slowly by about a third. The great thing about Berf en Croute is it can be served cold with this really brilliant sauce. It's made with creme fraiche, whole grain mustard and hot horseradish. All you do is combine the ingredients and serve. And some people actually prefer it cold. But if you do prefer to serve it hot, maybe on Boxing Day or New Year's Eve, I'm now going to show you how to get ahead with the vegetables. These are roasted roots with herbs, which I always prepare two or three days in advance. I bag them up, leave them in the fridge, then they're ready to use when I need them. Here I've got carrots, turnips, swede, parsnip, red onions, red potatoes, crushed garlic, olive oil, thyme, rosemary, sage, and of course seasoning. When I'm ready to cook them, I just whack them into the oven for about 35 to 45 minutes. Now we're going to stay with vegetables, and for those who prefer not to eat meat, the following recipe has always been a real winner. Because I've got something really special for you, and it's made with fresh sage. This came originally from a vegetarian who wrote to me and requested, could I do a special recipe with no meat, but with all the Christmas Day trimmings? It's a cheese and parsnip roulade, and you start with a traditional sage and onion stuffing, obviously without the pork, and spread it in a lined Swiss roll tin. Then make a classic white sauce and add three egg yolks. Then some grated strong cheddar cheese and a little more sage. Give it a mix and season well. Then whisk the egg whites to stiff peaks. Fold in one tablespoon to the roulade mixture, just to slacken it off. Then add this mixture to the rest of the whites and thoroughly fold them in. 
pour it over the stuffing and spread out evenly. Next, make a parsnip puree. Blend softened parsnips with butter, cream, and a pinch of nutmeg, and some seasoning. Lay out a sheet of baking parchment and sprinkle with chopped toasted hazelnuts. When the roulade is cooked, turn it out onto the hazelnuts and spread on the parsnip puree. Now, using the paper to help you, roll it up just like a Swiss roll. Finish with a sprinkle of vegetarian grated parmesan and it's ready to serve with either bread sauce or cranberry relish. While we're on the subject of sage, it also has a great affinity with potatoes. This is called potatoes boulangere and it's a great way of serving potatoes if you want to get ahead. In a buttered dish, add a layer of sliced potatoes, a layer of thinly sliced onions, and a sprinkling of chopped fresh sage. Add some seasoning, then repeat the whole process. Then add milk and stock together, and remember to put little flecks of butter on the top. Season again. They'll take an hour to cook, but if you want to prepare these well in advance, just cook them for 30 minutes, then another 30 minutes before serving. 10 minutes before the end, if you want them to look pretty, dip sage leaves in oil and lay them on top of the potatoes. They'll be nice and crisp when they come out of the oven. I'm very lucky that I married someone who loves Christmas just as much as I do. We both believe it's very much a family time, and what will always be an enduring memory for me is my own mother making sausage rolls. And now, neither Michael or I could possibly get through Christmas without them. Now I'm going to show you the quick flaky pastry I mentioned earlier. First of all, you freeze the butter until it's rock hard, then grate it into plain flour. It will give the pastry a sort of mouth-watering flakiness. Then flick the butter into the flour 